Well, thank you, Admiral Goldrick, for that, uh, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, thanks to uh, Chief of Navy for his hospitality uh, throughout, this, throughout this conference. Thanks to Captain Justin Jones for his hard work in bringing this all together. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to, to share the podium uh, both with Admiral Haney and with uh, James, James Goldrick. Um, I've been asked to address the topic of navies and the flexible application of, of power. Uh, when I first got the, the invitation to, to do so a number of months ago, uh, I leapt at the, at the chance. Um, first, of course, the chance to be here uh, in this beautiful city and this very special occasion, but also the, the opportunity to dive into a, a very important topic that, to my mind, hasn't received the amount of attention that it deserves. So my argument uh, is really in three parts. Uh, the first is uh, an intellectual one, and that is that although the contribution of sea power to victory in war has been widely studied, the effectiveness of navies in shaping, deterring, and reassuring remains underexamined. And that, to my mind, is a critical deficit because it represents so much of what navies do day to day. My second argument is a structural one, and that is that navies have, uh, have organized in various ways to fulfill their missions across the spectrum of, of conflict. These modes of organization send powerful signals to friend and foe alike about how a nation views sea power and how it views the range of naval missions. My third argument uh, is an analytical one. And that is that uh, a number of trends that have been in play for some time, but I think we see emerging even more now, a number of trends are conspiring to rob navies of their inherent flexibility. These include the spread of precision weaponry, long-term resource constraints, and the growing cost of naval forces. Responding to the emerging political, fiscal, an operational environment will require serious thinking of naval, uh, about naval force structure and posture. And quite frankly, I can't think of a better uh, venue to get that thinking started than our venue here. So let me start by talking uh, a little bit about the flexibility of sea power. I think most of us know intuitively that navies are inherently flexible instruments of of power. Among their most important attributes are their combination of mobility and persistence. Naval forces offer persistent presence without the need to acquire basing rights or occupy hostile territory. Although air forces are more mobile, they lack the ability to remain on station for long periods of time, at least without considerable support. Ground forces are, cons uh, are persistent and can possess great tactical mobility, but lack the inherent strategic mobility of naval forces. Naval forces are also useful across the spectrum of conflict. In peacetime, they're capable of demonstrating presence, shaping the behavior of other actors, reassuring allies, and deterring aggression. They're also useful instruments of peacetime competition. Finally, they provide the ability to respond rapidly to crises as well as to wage war. Speaking from an American perspective, naval forces have been central to US strategy in the Asia Pacific region for over a century. The US Navy has shown the flag and protected American lives and properties in Pacific waters since the mid 19th century. The United States has used the Navy to shape the behavior of other states, as it has done on numerous uh, occasions to enforce international norms of behavior, such as freedom of navigation. The US Navy has also acted to inf uh, ensure the free flow of goods, services, and information across the Pacific. And this has undergirded economic growth and prosperity, lifting millions out of poverty and serving as the midwife of globalization. Forward deployed naval forces have also given the United States the ability to respond rapidly to disasters, 
such as the December 2004 tsunami in Southeast Asia and the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident. It's also given the ability to re respond rapidly to crises, such as the 1995-96 Taiwan Straits crisis and more recent efforts by North Korea to coerce South Korea. The Navy has also served as a, as a deterrent. Throughout the Cold War and into the present day, one of the central missions of forward deployed naval forces has been that of deterring aggression. The Navy has also played a role in reassuring allies in the face of attempts at coercion. And last but certainly not least, the Navy has served as a powerful instrument of war, playing a leading role in the Pacific War and important supporting roles in the Korea and Vietnam Wars. Now, scholars have paid varying levels of attention to the different roles of naval forces. The role of sea power in grand strategy has long been a topic of, of study, and Alfred Thayer Mahan stands out still as one of the earliest and in many ways the best theorists of grand strategy. Mahan wrote persuasively about the deep interconnection between geography, society, economic systems, and military power. He wrote about what it, meant, what it means to be a sea power. Similarly, scholars have studied the role of navies in war and particularly how they can produce operational and strategic effects. The role that navies play in other parts of the conflict spectrum is less well understood, particularly the role of navies in presence, deterrence, and reassurance. This is in part because these missions are as much psychological as they are physical. In these cases, naval forces are meant to influence the decision-making calculus of the international community, competitors, and allies. And it's difficult to measure that impact, which is, in any event, situational. Naval presence, let's talk for a moment about naval presence. Naval presence serves as an expression of strategic interest and strategic attention. In the case of the United States, the deployment of naval forces is a reflection of the importance that Washington attaches to a particular region. However, there's been precious little research to determine what is needed to demonstrate presence, how much presence is enough, and for that matter, whether there's something as uh, too much presence. There's also little research to determine what attributes of naval forces are most effective in demonstrating presence. Well, how about deterrence? The purpose of deterrence is to convince potential aggressors that aggression will fail to yield anticipated benefits or that it will meet with disproportionate retaliation that will render it counterproductive. Deterrence theory holds that the effectiveness of a deterrent is the function of capability, credibility, and communication. Now, whereas capability is at least partially material, credibility and communication depend crucially on the perceptions of a particular competitor under a particular set of circumstances. And these can hardly be assumed. In fact, history contains cases where adversaries, far from being dissuaded, were actually emboldened by moves that were meant to deter. Reassurance. Reassurance is, in many ways, the, the converse, the flip side of deterrence. Reassurance seeks to convince an ally that it will be supported in the face of coercion or aggression. But like deterrence, the success of reassurance is crucially dependent on perceptions of capability, credibility, and resolve. However, we have only a tenuous understanding of what it is that allies look for in order to be reassured. Now, I make these points at length because I fear that we devote too little attention to the psychological dimension of, of sea power. However, we do so at our peril. We do so at our peril because we ignore, on the one hand, some of the great benefits of sea power and naval forces, but also by, by discounting the psychological uh, dimension, we run the risk of sending uh, bad signals or to friends as well as to competitors uh, through our force structure and our force posture. And it's, it's that that I'd like to move on to now. Uh, I'd like to move from mission to structure. 
That is, how navies have organized themselves to carry out this range of missions. Now, historically, navies have adopted different methods of deploying and employing naval forces and naval power across the spectrum of conflict. And let me highlight three different approaches. The first approach is what I would term periodic deployment. Most maritime powers base their navies in home waters or nearby waters on a day-to-day -day basis. They deploy their navies only periodically and then for a particular purpose, such as naval diplomacy, disaster response, crisis response, or combat. But their navies are principally based in home waters. A second approach that maritime powers have uh, adopted uh, is to specialize and differentiate their force structure and their force posture between forces and operations aimed at peacetime presence and peacetime missions and those tailored to fighting and winning wars. Britain in the 18th through uh, early 20th centuries and the United States prior to World War II relied upon small combatants uh, such as frigates to show the flag and coerce adversaries. They kept their capital ships concentrated in home waters to train and prepare for a decisive battle. Now a third model is the one uh, that the United States, and in, in particular, has uh, adopted or adopted uh, since the end of World War II. And that is a model based on forward deployed naval forces. In peace and in war, the US position has rested on a set of alliances, uh, forward bases, and the routine deployment of carrier strike groups, um, expeditionary strike groups, sur uh, surface action groups in peacetime to demonstrate presence, to deter, and to reassure. Significantly, the US approach uh, ever since World War II has mirrored its concept of operations in wartime. That is, the United States uses its most powerful naval assets as instruments of peacetime presence, assurance, and deterrence. In times of war, those very same forward deployed naval forces would serve as instruments of power projection. Allies, friends, competitors, the world as a whole has equated high-end warfighting capability with presence. Particular, particularly American aircraft carriers with presence and deterrence and reassurance. Now let me turn to the changing security environment because I think a number of trends uh, threaten this approach and with it the flexibility of sea power. And I'd like to highlight in particular three trends. The first is the spread of precision weaponry which is rendering naval surface forces increasingly vulnerable. Now this is a trend that's been in evidence for years. In fact, the first uh, precision weapon was used against a naval combatant in World War II uh, by Germany against US naval forces during the, uh, the Italian campaign. Uh, but it was the 1991 Gulf War, um, which scary for some of us to remember was 22 years ago, um, that really seemed to highlight for, uh, for many the, uh, the effectiveness of precision weaponry. Now, precision weapons have spread. Precision is routine, even expected. I think that's, that's certainly true to say in Australia as it is in, in the United States as well. We're in, living in an era of routine precision. Precision weaponry is spreading, continues to spread, uh, including the vital supporting capabilities needed to strike with precision, including the commercial sources of imagery, precision navigation and timing, and upgraded command and control. And a growing number of actors are acquiring precision, uh, precision munitions. Uh, among states, uh, certainly China's military modernization has emphasized precision weaponry. Uh, but the spread of precision strike is not limited to, to states. For example, Lebanese Hezbollah used uh, precision anti-tank missiles and also anti-ship cruise missiles against Israeli forces during uh, their uh, 2006 war with Israel. Uh, from, a, from a naval perspective, the spread of precision strike capabilities will increasingly 
threaten nations' ability to project power in time of war. Precision weaponry poses increasing threats to bases, and behind that also threats to power projection forces, including naval surface forces. As these trends continue and indeed accelerate, it becomes increasingly apparent, looking backwards, that we have been living in an era of easy power projection. Now, when I say easy, I don't mean uh, simple, uh, because power projection is inherently complex, but easy in terms of uh, relatively risk-free and relatively cost-free. Again, the epitome of that, uh, think about Operation Desert Shield, where a multinational coalition spent months deploying unmolested to the Gulf region, uh, preparing uh, extensively before evicting Saddam Hussein's Iraq from Kuwait. That was easy power projection. Now, of course, it was not always thus. World War II was an era of difficult power projection. Costly, bloody power projection. And it may not, and it may be, not be uh, thus in the future. A future campaign against an adversary armed with precision guided missiles, rockets, and mortars may more closely resemble the Normandy invasion and Iwo Jima than the relatively unopposed uh, attacks on, uh, on, on Iraq. By calling into question the ability to project power in wartime, uh, the, the spread of precision strikes threatens to undermine the ability of navies to deter and reassure in peacetime. To the extent that the US military in general and power projection forces uh, in, in, in particular uh, have underpinned global norms, the emergence of anti-access capabilities could undercut world order. For example, the development and diffusion of anti-access systems could undermine the principle of freedom of navigation. So navies across the world, I would argue, are facing an increasingly tough operational environment. So that's the first trend. The second trend involves long-term pressures on budgets in advanced industrial states arising out of limited economic growth and increasing demands for social spending. And I would argue that this is a trend broadly applicable across the developed world. Navies across the world are being squeezed and will continue uh, to be so. A third trend uh, that really uh, multiplies that, the, the trend that I just mentioned, is the long-term growth in the cost of navies. Growth in personnel costs, right? as navies have to compete against private industry and have to compete for uh, increasingly skilled manpower, and also the growth in the cost of naval forces. The warships moored in Sydney Harbor are highly capable ships. And as a navalist, I will say they're even beautiful. They pack a lot of sensor capability, command and control, strike, but they are also quite expensive. As a result, although individual naval combatants possess increasing capability, navies are, are able to afford fewer of them. Because capability is concentrated in fewer and fewer platforms, the relative value of any single naval combatant is going up. Naval combatants represent increasingly lucrative targets that leaders may be reluctant to put at risk in the future. In addition, a naval combatant, no matter how powerful, can only be in one place at a time. So the ability to, for, of naval forces to demonstrate presence and potentially to deter and reassure may thus become increasingly constrained over time. Now, taken together, these trends portend a shift in the environment in which navies will operate. Preserving the flexibility of naval forces in this new environment will require changes to both naval force structure and force posture, including greater specialization between forces for keeping the peace and those for fighting wars. 
And in, well, I'd like to conclude with four, uh, four ideas, four things uh, by way of uh, the start of, a, of an agenda for, for discussion of this issue. First, there's a need to develop new approaches to presence. Just speaking uh, for the United States in particular, um, this could involve moving away from large deployments, carrier strike groups, surface action groups, and towards a network of capable surface ships uh, as a more visible sign of US presence in the Asia Pacific region. So rethinking, rethinking presence, I think, is, is, an important, uh, is an important topic. Second, related to that, uh, there's a need for the United States and its allies to enter into a serious dialogue on extended deterrence and reassurance. The world has become accustomed to a certain form of presence. And the shift in the operational environment described above and the shift in force structure and force posture to accommodate it should actually be an opportunity for us collectively to strengthen deterrence and reassure allies and friends. But that's only going to happen through dialogue and discussion. Third, because of the, the changing uh, environment, there's a need to change the character of forward deployed forces to make them more survivable and hence more credible. Uh, certainly, uh, the United States and, and its allies should think about ways to harden and diversify their, uh, their support structure. Finally, the United States and its allies should increase their ability to strike at a distance in the face of growing anti-access threats. By bolstering the ability to strike precisely at a distance, they'll not only strengthen deterrence, uh, but also force competitors to increase their in investments in active and passive defenses. And investments in defensive capabilities represent resources that will not be available for offensive aims. Now, this is a challenging time for navies, but also an exciting one. And I believe that navies will be, if anything, more important to national and international security than they have been in the past. But they will only be so if they adjust. And making that so will require deep thinking and tough choices. But I can't think of a better pool of talent to begin tackling these challenges. So it's time to get started. Thank you. <laughs>